This is a study on uh, the physical crucifixion of Christ. Earlier, we uh, looked at the, the spiritual aspects of the crucifixion, and this time we will consider more of the physical aspects. Today is April 13, 2022. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his crucifixion and for his resurrection. We ask you to be with us. Help us to understand the things that are put forth in this lesson. Thank you so much. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As uh, we know from the scripture, there were three people crucified at the same time. The one in the middle uh, depicts Jesus on the cross being crucified. And the two others are robbers or some kind of evil people who were also being crucified at the same time on separate crosses. Now, one of those uh, uh, said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responded to him by saying, Today you will be with me in paradise. Now we will begin <clears throat> with the Last Supper, the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. It is not, as many people claim, a Passover meal. It was simply his Last Supper prior to his crucifixion. When they had finished, they sang a hymn and then went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And we are aware that the prayer in Gethsemane was, If possible, uh, Let's do this some other way, but not my will, but yours, Father, be done. And he sweat blood and agonized before the beginning of the crucifixion. So then they went from uh, the Garden of Gethsemane when the people came and captured Jesus, they were guided to him by Judas Iscariot. And he said, the one I kiss will be the one to capture. And so they captured Jesus and carried him to the residence of Caiaphas, the high priest at the time which was uh, very near the upper room where they had had the Last Supper. It's a fairly long way, and we'll see that Jesus was uh, probably very much exhausted by having traveled all night, going from place to place. And those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. This is the beginning of a long uh, trial of Jesus, conducted at night, which was illegal, but so much for that. He uh, began his trial in the house of Caiaphas. And <clears throat> then uh, he uh, had been brought around to the house of Caiaphas. 
And now when morning had come, all the chief priests and elders took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him up to Pilate, the governor. Now it's important to understand that sometime before the Sanhedrin, the chief uh, council, the uh, high uh, court of the Jews, had lost, they had taken away their ability to impose the death sentence. And so if they're going to put Jesus to death, they have to have the cooperation of the Romans since the Sanhedrin could not put him to death. And then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the Praetorium. That's the place where Pilate, the governor, lived. And it was early, and they them, they themselves did not enter into the praetorium. We're talking about the people going with those who had captured Jesus and going with Jesus. And they followed him over to the praetorium, but they wouldn't go in. That's a Gentile edifice. And the Jews there would not go in so that they wouldn't be defiled but might eat the Passover. This is uh, the final uh, plank in the platform that the Last Supper with his disciples was not the Passover meal. So, So after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe, sent him back to Pilate. And of course, Pilate, Pilate's wife had had a dream, and she counseled Pilate, said, have nothing to do with this man. He has done nothing wrong. <coughs> so... <coughs> Pilate would really like to let Jesus go. But he had the pressure, particularly from the Jews, to do something to crucify, to kill Jesus. So they sent him back to Pilate. So they went from uh, the place where he had interviewed with with uh, Herod, sent him back to the Praetorium, and there he met with Pilate. Um, the governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? There was a, a tradition, it was a, almost a rule, that at the time of the Passover, the governor would release a prisoner for them, and he presented to them both Jesus and Barabbas, who was a notorious evil person. And he said, which of these do you want to be released? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. Then he released Barabbas for them. But after having Jesus scourged, he delivered him to be crucified. <coughs> Here is scourging. Perhaps, as some people suggest, Pilate thought that if he scourged Jesus, that the people would then let him go. And that didn't happen, but he did have him scourged. And the victim to be scourged would be tied like so on a post 
with his hands lifted up and some Roman soldiers would then take the whip which had leather thongs and in the pits and in the leather would be bits of bone and rocks and so on and they would beat him in the way that is depicted here one would stand on one side one on the other and they would alternately strike him across the back with that whip each time taking away some more of his back flesh bleeding him and of course being very painful then Pilate released Barabbas for them but after having Jesus scourged he delivered him to be crucified <clears throat> now he was uh, Jesus was then taken in this where this is shows on the red uh, markers perhaps to the search church of the holy sepulcher now that is the place that the, the uh, roman catholic church insists was the location where jesus was crucified there was another place uh, shown at the end of this called the garden tomb and there's another location uh, just around the corner there and which um, in modern days uh, had been convincing evidence that that was the place of his crucifixion notice that whichever one is correct was outside the gates of Jerusalem as was specified he would be put to death outside the camp. This is a picture of the garden tomb. You see the tomb here in the side of the rock. And uh, people often visit that when they visit uh, Israel. When we went there, we, uh, we met outside the garden tomb sat on some benches and had communion together at that place. So then Jesus, depicted as this man, he has a, a piece of wood tied to his arms and he was supposed to carry that piece of wood the cross piece and he would carry it to the location of the crucifixion the upright portion would already be in the ground and it would it would be uh, be standing upright the wood was not plain to be smooth it was rough uh, what we would call the rugged cross and that is there were splinters all in it now <clears throat> this is the time when jesus fell he could not carry that piece of wood and so someone carried it for him simon of cyrene then he would be lifted up onto the upright and we see here that the, uh, the cross piece is already there but he would be lifted up just like that and would be attached to the upright you'll notice there's a uh, there's a foot piece where his feet would be placed and then his arms would be placed against the cross piece. You notice that there was placed over him a sign. 
<clears throat> that said in three languages, Jesus, the Son, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The Jews objected to Pilate, saying, you should put, he says he's the King of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. And so it was allowed to stay there. Now, this is a low tower cross, you see. It would make a T. And here's another couple of versions. Probably the one on the right is the one that was used because it had a place to put the sign above him. When he was uh, lifted up, he was then, in this instance, it could be he was tied with a rope, but in Jesus' instance, he was nailed to the cross piece through his arms by spikes. Now, we talk about his hands being uh, fastened to the cross, but the bones in his hand probably could not bear his weight. And that is, the spikes would simply pull out and pull loose from his hands, and it was far more likely that the, the nail was placed between the two bones in his forearm at the wrist at the ulna and the radius. And so he would be fastened by his arms to the cross piece. Now, don't imagine that he was sort of spread-eagled, widely spaced. No, he has to have some space left so he would be attached to the cross piece with some slack in his arms. His feet would be crossed over, as shown here, and then nailed together to the platform so that there would no be no problem in, in his feet about the nail pulling out because he was on that platform on the upright. And so... He would be placed in the cross on that in that way. And notice, I will point out more forcefully that his knees have to be bent. He could not be put up with his legs straight. So this is how he would be attached. And as you see, this is the person attached to the cross and in two different positions. One is that he would sink down because of the agony in his hands and arms and he would, through exhaustion, he would sink down. His knees would bend. And he would be hanging from his arms. And as he sunk down, the, the rugged cross, the splinters in the cross, would tear some more of his back. Now, when he was down like that, he really couldn't breathe very well. All he could do was just pant. This would make him extremely short of breath. He couldn't tolerate that for long. And so he would have to push to straighten his legs out, push up so that he could then breathe. Now, he can't tolerate the feet pressure that long. And so, as long as he was on the cross, he would be moving up and down in order to breathe. 
and every time he would move up or down, he would tear some more of the flesh on his back. Now, some other things would happen in this position. One is that he would develop what's called congestive heart failure, and he would accumulate fluid in the right side of his chest. Now, that would cause the up fluid from the upper part of his body and his head to sink down into his chest and lower part of his body, which would then produce an intense thirst. And Jesus, one of his sayings on the cross, I thirst. Now, it was common that the soldiers, perhaps to take pity on him, would take a sponge on a stick and soak it in sour wine and according to one of the Gospels it, it, the wine would be mixed with myrrh M-Y-R-R-H now myrrh among other things is an anesthetic so if the person drank the sour wine with the myrrh, he'd go to sleep. Now, if he goes to sleep, he can't push up anymore. He can't breathe properly, and he will die shortly. Incidentally, a person who was crucified, but who was otherwise in pretty good physical uh, condition, could easily exist on the cross still alive after five or six days so that would be uh, an, uh, an act of mercy is to let him go to sleep uh, sink down can't breathe would die this is a chest x-ray of a person and as with normal chest x-rays, it's pictured as though they were facing you so that the, the side on our left would be the right side of that person. And you see the fluid accumulating on the right side of the chest. This is common with heart failure. And the other side would be relatively clear, and that's how he, that's what he would use to breathe with. Now, <clears throat> so, the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, this is this, this, during the time of the Passover, Passover, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for well, that Sabbath was a high day, ask Pilate that the legs might be broken. This was a common practice. If you got tired of all of this and you want to bring it to an end, take a sledge or a big pole or something, break their legs. Now, that meant that they could no longer push up to breathe, and they would die in a short period of time. So they asked that they be, their legs be broken. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus... When they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Now, it was part of the original definition and description of Passover that the bones of the Passover lambs were not broken. 
and just so Jesus's legs in accord with the pattern were not broken. When they saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And immediately blood and water came out. This is from John chapter 19. So, now this is a depiction of where the spear was almost certainly placed. It would be through the front part of the right side of his chest and probably going all the way into the thin portion of the heart, the right side of the heart. Now, if you do it that way, the first thing you'll come to is the accumulated fluid in the lung capacity in the right lung and they would be come out then what looked like water or fluid and if you pre push the uh, spear even further into the right side of the heart then you would get blood as well so that would produce the appearance of uh, fluid and blood. This is a painting by Michelangelo. Michelangelo was a, a famous painter. In, uh, in addition to other things, he was an expert anatomist. And so he would figure out exactly where and the spear would be placed. In this picture of Christ dead, I have drawn a, a, a arrow pointing to the break in the right side of Christ's chest. That is, is very likely exactly the way the spear would have been placed. However, despite all this horror, the real horror of the cross, as we talked about earlier, is about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, what he said was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From Jesus' point of view, this is the real horror. The physical torture that he endured was horrible. But there were many people crucified and others available to be crucified physically. And a Roman soldier, we under, or a Roman officer, rather, we're told, uh, sent a letter to the emperor saying, there have been so many crucifixions in this region that we are running out of trees. Commonly, the crucifixion would be take place along a roadway so that the people walking by would see the person being crucified and would get some kind of message from it. So the horror from Jesus' point of view was not so much the physical horror, which was enough, but it was the spiritual horror in which his father, acting not as his father, but as his judge, killed him on the cross spiritually, and then restored him spiritually 
while still on the cross. Well, that may have been on Friday. Uh, the Catholic Church has uh, uh, decreed that the crucifixion occurred on Friday. I don't believe that's accurate. I believe that the crucifixion was on Thursday. However, whichever, whether he died on Thursday or Friday, but we know that, as the old preacher said, Sunday is a coming when he would be raised from the dead. Have a blessed Resurrection Day. Father, we thank you for being with us as we reflect on the physical crucifixion of Christ. It's a magnificent plan that you and he put together and to produce the redemption of mankind and the putting to death of sin so that those who come to Jesus in faith and in trust could have eternal spiritual life and rather than being consigned to an eternal death in hell would have eternal spiritual life and live with the Godhead eternally. Thank you so much. And we will subsequently look more at what happened on the day when he appeared from the grave. Amen.